this is like a time capsule of what cup technology was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Got a, a Purex car out here. Y'all want to do something, put, put the motor in something. It bolts right in there. You think you can still drive a stock car? Huh? Oh. You ever driven a stock car, like recently? Uh, what's recent? So he's saying we can get that engine freshened up, put it back in that car, yeah. and get you back in the car. We're at Pro Motor Engines right now with that Ford C3 in there that we pulled out of Lake Speed Senior's garage with Lake Junior, who's the, the marketing tech guru at Total Seal Piston Rings. And we're gonna get a baseline on that engine to see what it does after it's been sitting for how long? Uh, about 20 years. Okay long time and he used to vintage road race with that engine in one of his old cup cars didn't he yeah so the one you saw in the last video uh the 92 or 83 purex car that 92 thunderbird he has a vintage, he vintage raced it actually saw one of those last races and you know like he was saying those guys had modern engines and all that he was way down in horsepower compared to those guys with this old engine which is this is era you know probably early 90s spec type engine like so, early 90s cup type engine. Yeah, early 90s cup type engine to what this thing really is. So this is a Ford C3, a C3 heads. What does that mean for somebody? This is like a Windsor based block, right? Yeah, so this is essentially what a cup engine was, a Ford cup engine was in the early 90s. Of course, that was a 92 Thunderbird that he was racing. So this was supposed to be the type of engine that would have been running in that car at that time because dad was trying to keep to the spirit and the intent of vintage racing, okay. uh, which then like you heard in the other video, he, those guys escalated it and there were the cars that were four or five years old, vintage racing is like, that's not fair. <laughs> so it'd be interesting to see how this engine actually does relative to what we know was at the time, a 2003, 2004 engine he was racing against. Well, here's the part I'm really excited about. So this is like a time capsule of what cup technology was you know 20 25 years ago you know i know that at my time at joe gibbs racing and the engine department doing the development of the oil program an 043 piston ring for example was like state of the art in like 2002. today they run a 0.5 millimeter ring that's like half the thickness so to explain that to people who don't understand what what exactly piston rings are. You're talking about the thickness of the ring that goes, like the groove in the piston. Yeah, so every piston has a groove in it, right? Because the piston is trying to hold the combustion energy and turn it into work. That's what that makes, engines make horsepower, right? Yeah. It's from the fuel burning and making combustion, right? That's the cool part. Well, the piston rings are the seal that keep all that combustion from going, blowing by into the crankcase. In fact, there's a blow-by gauge back there on the wall. So what we're gonna do is dyno the engine and see how much power it makes. We also wanna monitor all the other vitals of the engine. What's the blow-by? You know, modern engines have crankcase vacuums, a way of making the engine more efficient. So what's gonna be cool is to see what this engine actually does and then take it apart and find out what's inside. Then we'll learn, okay, why is it doing what it's doing? Then, keeping the same heads and manifold and block, modernize it and see how much power we can make. It's supposed to make 730, right? That's of course, what he said. That's what he said, right? Of course, it's run for a little bit, so it may be down a little bit, because as engines ran, it was totally common back in the day for an engine to be down you know, 10, 15 horsepower at the end of a race. So this thing's got like four or five races on it, which those weren't as long as a cup race. So, I mean, if it's down 50, that wouldn't be shocking. So we'll see what she does. Okay. And for, for lingo's sake, like, I'm glad you explained what blow by is because we're gonna be talking about that. That's like the, the combustion force blowing by the piston that's not, it's energy not being transferred to the downward motion of the piston. Exactly. So it's making less horsepower. Right, so I'm gonna drop a fancy word on you. So my job is I'm a tribologist. So tri tribology is the study of friction, wear, and lubrication. That's what I did for Joe Gibbs Racing and we won lots of championships with Tony Stewart, Bobby Labonte, and Kyle Busch and all those guys. So I do that same job at Total Seal. So what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of blow-by, reduce the amount of friction, that way the engine's more efficient. Yeah, the power is made from the air going in the engine and the fuel. 
So that's what we call brake specific horsepower. Like how much power can the engine make if there was no friction, no losses? Right, okay. so that, that's the airflow in the camshaft guy. That's all the smart guy. Like I've already talked to my buddy, Billy Godbolt at Comp Cams. Like they're totally on board to get us new valve train for this thing and modernize this engine so that we get more air, more fuel, so we can make more power. My job is to make sure as much of that power that we make in combustion gets to the crankshaft. Okay, so you have your, your maximum potential number and you are minimizing the spread between what it's like maximum volumetric efficiency is. Bingo. Versus what it's actually, actually doing. What, what actually gets to the tires. Okay. You know, going back to the Morgan McClure video you did, right? That's what those guys were trying to do. You know, with, with all that stuff they were doing in the manifold and all that, they were trying to get as much air and fuel into that engine as possible. And then that was the early days of plate racing. And then of course NASCAR came up with all these rules to take away all their tricks. Well, once you run out of tricks to get more air in the engine, the only thing you could do for a plate motor to make it better was reduce friction and losses everywhere else in the engine. And that's where, you know, 2003, 2004, I came to work with Joe Gibbs Racing and we went hardcore into tribology in order to make the engines more efficient, which is when all of a sudden Joe Gibbs Racing engines took off, right? It was not the only reason, but it was one of the reasons for that team's success is that we really began to look at friction and how do you minimize friction, not just cram more air and more fuel into the engine. Okay, that all, that all makes sense. This is pretty cool. Well, this is, this is the fun part is that rarely do you find a running engine like this that's that old, that literally is a time capsule. What did a cup engine look like? in 1992 okay what can we do with it 30 years later <laughs> and how much more power can we make so you know, i've got crazy numbers in my head of what i think we can make at this it's gonna be really fun to find out what she says today what we can do and what we find out when we pull it apart then the really cool part is going to be when we put it back together what does it really do then because that's where you're you got to put your money where your mouth is right yeah pme has been around for how I mean, like <laughs> they've been around since the 70s, I think. Yeah, but, yeah. But they started off in Chicago and, and then came here as a NASCAR thing grew because Peter Gal, that was the start, the owner of it and founder, they were doing road race stuff, right? And then as that grew, that they just kept on moving and growing, and it came down here. Like I said, the last couple of years of my dad's career, PME did the engine, so this is a perfect marriage of everybody right here. You had, you know, my dad's car, his career. These guys were doing the engines for him, and now we're resurrecting one of these engines. Now they didn't build this engine. This is not a PME engine. This is an engine that you know Dad bought at an auction and had one of his other friends uh, rebuild for him to do the the vintage racing. Uh, but it's going to be cool to see what we all can do to this engine and bring it up to current spec in terms of the internal technology and how much of a gain there really is by changing that technology. You know, what I just thought it's going to be really cool is. Um, if we are able to spice this thing up a lot and get it back in the car, what your dad's reaction will be when he drives that car again and is like, oh my God, yeah, I, can't I wish wait. this car did this 15 years ago. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. I can't wait. Like, he's been driving that twin engine car and he beats all these guys who come from all around the country. Young guys, old guys, they all show up to try to beat him on that twin engine car and he still wears them out. And so it's going to be cool to put him back how old is he now? Car. He's 74. <laughs> He's 74 and was going what, almost 94 miles an hour, you know, a yeah. month or so ago. Yeah. In, in this twin engine go-kart. It terrifies me on that open wheel go-kart. Like just thinking of if anything went wrong, like how much pain you'd be in. Like it's just crazy. I'm telling you, if you go watch any of the YouTube videos out there of him racing, he is still so smooth and so good. He's such an experienced racer. I me, mean, like I said, start off when he's 13 years old you know, running around the parking lot at his house. He just can see things and knows what's about to happen based on experience that you, you can't teach that. Yeah. And so I think um, at his age, he's in great shape. He's continued to race and stay sharp. There won't be any problem dropping him in that race car. Okay, so how do we get this thing fired up and see 
I mean, they, they already got it bolted up here and made sure it runs, so we didn't waste our time coming here and having it be blown up or something, so. Right. But we don't know what it's gonna do. No, so yeah, they've already got it warmed up and figured out, okay, yeah, yeah, it, it runs, it doesn't leak and all that, and they're ready to go. So, we got all the fuel hooked up, everything. We've got manifold vacuum, we got everything hooked up here so they can do the full dyno work on it. So, at this point, we just gotta go out there and, and let Dennis and the guys um, dyno the engine. All right, let's do it. This is old restrictor plate slug. Out. Now it's a pen holder. Can you make that? Excuse me? Can you made that one? No. I just kept it because it's like nostalgia. <laughs> Really is yeah, we're gonna have to get a more detailed explanation on how these work. This is like the thing that was inside that Ernie Urban intake manifold that Larry McClure was showing us. Except theirs looked like it had a lot of weird bridges and stuff in it that this one doesn't have. But it, it's interesting. But now it's a pen holder. <laughs> God, that sound deadening is intense. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it is. So he's going in there to check the timing. So majestic with the air flowing in the wind like that. And the thing, he looks like he's in like a wind tunnel. Ready? Yep, we're ready. to it. Yeah, five degrees. So is it a 35 now? Yeah. Does that say 456, 457? Yeah. That, that's an average between 6,000 8,000, this is the number it makes where this cursor is, uh, that's, that's the peak number. Okay. So it made 475.9, and like that, it made 476 with more timing. And, and depending upon the motor, sometimes they just don't respond. Seems to be a little bit off from what your dad thought it was. You know, I remember him running this engine up at VIR one time, and the other guy behind him being able to get about eight car links on him on the straightaway. <laughs> I think I know why now. <laughs> Could be like a 312 if it was running in a Trans Am. Does it be the cubic inch limit? Does it sound like a smaller motor to you? It's kind of hard to tell. like a small motor because small motors usually have everything upstairs but it's got a pretty reasonable amount of torque. It just yeah. falls off really. Well after 8,000 that's done. Do you right. think it's being like not making enough power because it's wounded from being raced without being refreshing five six times or sitting for 15 years. Exactly. Uh, the sitting for a long time definitely hasn't helped it. I mean, I'm watching the blow-by out there, That I think that's probably the biggest telltale, is that each of those things is uh, one CFM, right, Dennis? So it starts at the bottom at one and goes all the way up. Yeah, that little, like, white, white mark. Right, yeah, wow. so make a sweep and let him report it real quick, and we'll, we'll talk through and show you what we're seeing here. Because right now, it's bouncing around two CFM. As soon as he loads it, it's jumping up to almost four CFM. Now let's watch it over the run here. All right, almost to five CFM, I think. That's a lot. Yeah, just give you an idea. A couple weeks ago, we were out at Ron Shaver's place doing a, some testing on some new rings for us, one millimeter ring. We saw two CFM a blow by on a brand new engine just doing braking work. And that would go down once it's seated and broke in, right? Yeah, I mean, we've seen it as low as one CFM on a dry sump engine. That's not even a wet sump. We can get it, that's no crankcase vacuum, none of that stuff, just a 
one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter ring package, and we're getting two, two and a half CFM of blow by, this thing is double that. So how much, a uh, rule of thumb on something like this, how much power is one CFM of blow by costing you? <sighs> Hard to really put a number to that, but I can tell you this thing made what, almost 480 right there, just about. Okay, so that little small black Chevy that's a 383 makes 450. So that's this, this thing's only 30 horsepower over a small block with a 600 CFM carburetor, and that's an 830 double pumper. Yeah, so this is like six liter with a cam in it at the wheels horsepower. <laughs> like this is like a stock LS engine with some mods horsepower. I keep it's thinking back. Than mine. Yeah. <laughs> I keep thinking back to that race at VIR when the other guy is just. I mean, Dad's through the technical bit has got about six, seven car lengths on him. The other guy catches him, passes him on the straightaway. Every lap they're trading the lead because on the straightaway the guy can just drive by him like he's tied to a rope. And just, I, I think I know why now. Just sucking his windows out. Yeah. Every straightaway. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that probably has something to do with it. What's your theory, Dennis? It's tired. Dennis is the man here. It's it just tired. It looks tired. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the blow-by gauge says it's really tired. Well, we're gonna find out. And it's got some moisture in the blow-by too, so. Oh, it's sometimes. pumping water in there, yeah. Not okay. a lot, but it is moisture. Got the head gasket. From somewhere, more than likely. Unfortunately, it is what it is. Oh, it just makes 480 horsepower. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I guess that leaves us a lot of room for improvement. It does, so because like you know, I was thinking, all right, 730 is what he said it was. I figured it might be down 40 or 50. Price would be up high 600s, and I'm thinking, okay, an impressive number to freshen it all up and come back would be, man, if we get 780, 800 would be pretty impressive. We got our work cut out <laughs> to jump from there to here, but we'll see what we can do. Okay. You got the work with. Yeah, exactly. We have no, we literally have no idea what's inside that thing. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe those cylinder heads he got from his friend have too much volume in the runners for the camshaft that's in it, or it's not, you know, there's, they could be mismatched parts. We have no idea what's inside. We're going to find out. And that's going to be the fun part. Okay. And you get to come along for the ride. So now we got this thing off the dyno. Are you going to, are you going to, uh, spearhead the tear down. Oh yeah, I'm gonna tear it apart. All right. My curiosity won't let me go home and just not know. I got, I gotta know. I was really, today. I was really hoping we were gonna do this today. Cause I'm like, oh, I don't want to wait another It'd week be and like a half. A major cliffhanger. Well, especially now, right? Cause the question is, as the guys noted, based on that horsepower output, is it actually 358 cubic inches? <laughs> yeah. It, it may not be. <laughs> You know, there were some small bores, small cubic inch stuff that was being done in road racing at the time. Yeah, so this is the blow-by gauge we were looking at while we were dynoing it. And we thought it was about five, but actually it was about seven. So just a regular old small black Chevy is going to be somewhere around two, two and a half. This thing was up here about seven. But that's still at 200 horsepower. <laughs> yeah, that's... You know, you, you'd like to think every uh, CFM's 50. That'd be nice, but no, that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> so is this when it's C3? Is that Cle C for Cleveland? What, what does that What does that mean? I don't know anything about any of this. How is this? How far straight is this from a 351 Windsor? Is there, is there anything uh, the, in common with that? The heads are similar to the old 351 Cleveland, as far as that's kind of where the head is very similar or has similarities. Um, the block is a Windsor, would be a Windsor cam line. Okay. But when these things came out in the late 80s, early 90s, when they started, the, the main lines was a Cleveland. So the two and three quarter inch stroke, or main journal. And so that was basically, it was a kind of a combination. It had a Windsor layout on the short block, different deck height than the Cleveland, or a lot of them were. Some of them were, the, the deck height for a Cleveland was a 9200. Some of these are 9200. Some of them were 9500, and then later on they became 9 inch. Okay. But, but this one, we're gonna find out. I'm guessing it's a 9200, but um, looking at the block and the freeze plugs, this block would have been had to have been after, I'm gonna think after 94, 94 to 98 would be the year I would think this block was. So. Is, and this is, is it an SVO block, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. So it's like cast by Ford, sold for their performance 
program to race teams. That's right. Is that where these heads originated too? That's what the heads are, yep. They, they, they made a lot of these heads, yeah. Robert Yates did a lot of the early development on the cylinder head. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Roush was involved with it. You'll see a lot of the early manifolds like this mm -hmm. one. What does this one say on it? Does it have Roush's name? Yeah, it does. I was looking for the yeah, Jack. The early one all had the Roush thing on it. Yeah, the early ones had Jack Roush on them. And then, uh, and then later on they put SVO on them. I don't remember if that was on the early this ones. This was or a not. Wilson one, it says. Yeah. yeah. Wil Wilson ported this manifold though. So why was this plucked? It's a great question. That that's basically it was a breather. <laughs> it's it's plugged. You could you could probably do something with it. It covers that. When you when you run this engine and if it's if it's sealed properly, you want it plugged. Okay. Now so the, you can on the dyno, it's just it's just a port on the dyno that you can put a fitting on so you can draw vacuum. Or if you wanted to do it in the car, I don't think anybody did, but hmm. you could there. But basically, for a, for a dyno guy, that would be on there. You just have a port there you could access. We accessed it over here today, but because because back at that time we were starting to get better to where we made vacuum. Before that, you know, the, up until the late '80s, early '90s, we all had breathers on them. Our ring ring seal required it. Hmm. Once we got things to where they started working well, the dry sump system started evacuating the combustion. You started making less combustion in the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, things got better. The ring started doing a much better job. So this is a C3. What's a D3? D3 is the next generation cylinder head Okay. from this. And then that, that, that head lasted for I don't know the exact amount. It was somewhere around a 10 year period, 8 year period. And then the FR9 is the engine now. Okay. So, so the, the FR9 is completely different. You know, where you can look at the D3 would go on this block. Hmm. The, the heads had a lot of similarities. Okay. So the the progression was like it was C3, D3, FR9. Yeah. And before before the C3, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm correct, but I think it was a B head. It was a it was a cannon valve before this. They had a cannon valve huh. in the late '80s because we had done some of those also. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about the Ford lineage. So this is cool, yeah. learning this stuff. Good stuff. Helps provide some context for people watching this, so they understand what they're looking at, or like why it's significant, or kind of tie the era to it better. Well, a lot of people that are probably watching this don't know technical stuff at all. Like they're mm -hmm. they're learning too. Mm -hmm. I'm helping. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first plan of attack? Top to bottom is how I always go. Cool. So does that mean valve covers or intake manifold first? I'm gonna take the um, valve covers off. I'm gonna get this thing put aside because this is just their motor plate for trucking it around. There's nothing super special inside the manifold, I don't think. But I do want to peek inside just to see. So, yeah, this is just for moving parts or moving engines around. It smells good. I like that smell. Yeah, it's got a little epoxy in there. Right, yeah, curiosity sake. What kind of fuel do they dyno it on? Probably one uh, 114 Sunoco, more, most likely so. I don't know if this was said on camera yet, but when we got here, they said that they did a compression check and everything on this, and it all checked out fine. Like there wasn't a dead cylinder or anything. Right. So there's. And for it to, to still make power to, to 8,000 RPM, you know, like, uh, to, for it to even make power that high, but make that small, that little amount of power just seems weird to me. Like, how can, it, how can it make power that high, but not make very much? Well, that's the interesting thing, is that the blow-by was high, but it didn't just go crazy at the top. Mm -hmm. It just was high and stayed high. Yeah. And the vacuum was you know, six, seven inches, and it stayed there. So it wasn't responding to RPM in a way that you think, oh, there's just like a broken ring or something like that. It was just made it where you know this thing's messed up and wrong. So, yeah, it's going to be really curious. I mean, I, I think that this is observation a hunch that it's a small cubic inch is probably accurate. Yeah, everything, everything adds up that it doesn't seem... Nothing doesn't make sense except the small number. Unless we pull the cylinder heads off and the, and the pistons are like reverse dish and the things like super low compression or something like that. Because there were nine to one bush engines back in the day. Huh. So that was one of the 
the specs they had is they had a uh, spec spec carburetor and you were limited to nine to one on compression ratio. So if the bottom end is actually a nine to one, and that could make some sense. Thank you. Welcome. Man, I don't have bad rockers. That's not a Dell West retainers. From 21 June 01. 20 years, there we go. I, th I thought it was about a 20 year old engine, so there we go. There's your production stamp, we now you know. It said June 01. These were on my birthday. No, not yet. <laughs> oh, you brought us one already. Oh. You're on top of it. Try to be. No, you're good. Thank you. There's, there's one side okay. down. Maybe it was nine to one, and then he got these special heads that had bigger chambers than what they were supposed to be, and maybe it knocked it down even more. But now, you know, looking back on the dyno, when it really didn't respond to five degrees of timing, it didn't really care. Mm -hmm. That could be a good indication that it is nine to one. Because hmm. a higher compression engine usually will like timing more. Oh, springs. 697 on those rockers. Those are big old springs. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah it's, my buddy Billy Godbold is going to freak. He's like, oh yeah, there's, <laughs> there's free horsepower just by getting rid of those giant monsters. Uh, of course, you got to take the valve train way out, so the valves are probably pretty heavy too. That distributor gear has seen some action. It's quite worn. Chewed yeah. up. How much longer do you think that could be run before it would... I mean, that, that wear almost looks like it was just happening now. These pieces, fresh it's pieces pretty, stuck to it. Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty bad. We'll definitely have to replace that. <laughs> there goes the manifold. That came off easy. It wasn't stuck to anything. Yeah. There's some pretty looking head ports. And it smells so good. I wish cameras could pick up smell. <laughs> Sometimes I'm really glad they don't. This time I wish it did. So this is sucking oil out of the valley? Yes. Yeah, so you've got a scavenge, you got a dry stop pump over here. That's what makes these things kind of cool is that a normal engine, you have it's called wet sump. So you have an oil pump down in the oil pan. Uh, in the old days they ran off a distributor gear. With these engines, you have this dry sump pump for the pump that's external to the engine and you don't keep, even though there's an oil pan, you're not keeping the oil, not storing the oil in the oil pan. This is basically being scavenged out and it goes to a remote, call it dry sump tank. So each of these red sections is a scavenge section where it's pulling oil out of the engine. So this one right here is taking oil from the valley out and then these three are pulling oil from the pan. Because the road race engine, you've got one on the, on the right side and you got two on the left hand side. Uh. So it's that way as the car turns left and right, it can pick up oil either direction. Okay. Each one of these, isn't that, they call that a stage? Yep, the stage, yeah. So this would be, they call, this would be a five stage pump because you have four scavenge stages, sections, and you've got one pressure section. Okay. So the more places you need to pull from, the more stages you need to have. Yes. Is a oval track engine one less stage because it doesn't have to pull from the other side? No, you just pull them from over, pull them over here. Oh, right? so you so, just add that stage to the, the important side. Right, so what you would really like to do is have five scavenge sections because each cylinder pair, you can put a divider in between the cylinders so there's less crosstalk. Um, especially w windage wise, so oil is moving back and forth. That's one of the things that robs power from the engine is the amount of windage, how, how the oil gets wrapped around the crankshaft. So it's like trying to run down the road versus run down the swimming pool. Yeah. A lot easier to run down the street than it is to run through the swimming pool. Well, that's why the FR9 has those dividers between yes. each bank. Yeah. Yes. We'll, right. we'll show you that. There's some sitting out there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So having that divided crankcase is more efficient so each of those sections needs its own scavenge and then you still want to keep the oil on the top of the engine from dropping down on the crankshaft so i suspect because of this being located here we may find that the cam tunnel may be closed off it may not be hmm. a lot of engines um 
in the early 2000s, we installed a cam tunnel to keep the oil that was going to the camshaft from dropping down on the crankshaft to reduce windage. When you do that, you have to have a pickup on the top of the engine in order to pull the oil out. Hmm. I mean, you don't have to, um, but it's one way of controlling oil flow in terms of trying to reduce the amount of friction you know, and losses in the engine as a whole. So yeah, this is uh, the valley scavenge. So ideally you'd have one more stage and pull it from the bottom. And for road racing on the, the modern stuff, you can pull two from one side, two from the other side. That's something McClure did is they said they had a dry sump pump driven off the rear end that they could switch on with a ball valve to pull more vacuum in the engine. Yep, or pump air into the engine one of the two. Uh, that's a thought. <laughs> just, just saying, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that pump can go either direction. You can pull more vacuum or you could pump air to the engine. Which, hmm. Whichever floats your boat. <laughs> not saying anything, Larry. This is possible. Somebody, just saying, I'm some, just saying somebody, theories from the, in the past, right, that people saw that and they theorized that maybe you could be pumping air to the engine. <laughs> don't know. They know, um, we don't know. Someone probably did that. Even if it wasn't them, someone could probably be. did that. Could be. All right, so we got this part, so now it's time to take the heads off. He says to, I'm gonna take the world according to Tom, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Okay, We're ready? Ready for liftoff. No, nothing's broken, but there's definitely like some crud on the, the wall here. What does the chamber look like? Yep, that's a cylinder head. About all I can tell you. <laughs> there are people with better eyes, more, more experienced eyes than I on on that. Valves are kind of different colors. The back two are brighter than the front two. Don't know if that means anything. It's fuel distribution. On an intake, though, right? On an intake with like a throttle body in the front, that would make sense because more air always ends up in the back. But I've oh, it, it definitely happens on these things. I thought they were designed to not do that. Well, you try to minimize it, but you don't fix it. Huh. Uh, you can do uh, in-cylinder pressure transducers on every cylinder and on a common plenum uh, carburetor. Do you like that? Or even throttle body, it's going to be different all eight cylinders. Huh. It's one of the tricks people were doing was they would actually have different cam lobes for each cylinder to try to maximize each cylinder. Because the V8 engine is really eight single cylinder engines with a common so can we find out what the if it's tiny or not? Kind of too antsy you didn't get the other head off. I guess it's already unbolted. We could just lift yeah, it off. Well, but we need to know. Well, you, you can see where it where it's been sitting, right? So that's where it's set. Because you got a little bit of rust and stuff in there, or discoloration. Yeah. Because that's where the fist, that's where the ring pack was sitting. So top to bottom, that's where the oil probably where the oil ring was sitting. It's got good parts in it. HTC hanked the crank in it. Yeah. Yep. Curl How rods. about that? Yeah. Yep. We can keep those. Oh, yeah. Hank the crank. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. What's that? Uh, he was really, he, had, his, uh, he was kind of the premier crank builder back, back in the day. So what era is that from? Well, it's from the 90s, but, but he was, uh, at the tail end of what he was doing in the 90s and the for me the 80s i don't know before that he was the he was the guy hmm. yeah but yeah this isn't some giant heavy crank no. this is a good good crank then is yeah it, we can it, keep this crank so there's still no like major problem there's no reason that no. makes sense we still no. don't know why no it was verified this is not a tiny engine it's in the 350 something range yep we have no good reason for its lack of horsepower yeah just call it what it is that mean you got cp pistons in it yeah this is all good stuff inside there's nothing weird or wrong it's good <laughs> she's out now probably number 43 got lateral gas ports in it so yeah we'll get the set of calipers out and measure it that's about what i thought it would be full round piston it's not a box style piston it's the older style full round 
what's a box style piston. We probably have some in here we can show you. Where the box style, as opposed to having all of this area mm -hmm. out here, goes, goes around, the box style comes off of here and supports that area. So all that area is removed. Oh. Uh, so it takes weight out of the piston, makes the piston lighter. Okay. So more RPM. I don't know why, for whatever reason, there's no audio in this clip, but what Dennis is doing right now is checking the specs of the camshaft just to make sure it doesn't have some kind of weird uh, non-aggressive cam in it that could explain the lack of power this thing was making. And it did not turn out to be the case. It had specifications that would fall in line with what it should be to make the power it was told to make. So we still don't have a smoking gun explanation as to why this thing doesn't make the power that Lake Senior said it did. What is this thing? So this is a profilometer. So it measures surface roughness. So we can measure the size, right? You said it was an 04, uh, four inch 062 that the piston said the bore size is. All right, but what's the actual texture of the surface? Because for the rings to seal, they have to have oil in the cylinder wall. And the key thing about that surface roughness is that's what retains the oil. Oil is the gasket between the piston ring and the piston and the cylinder wall. So you want to have it smooth enough that it's not high friction, high wear, but you also want it to have enough valley to hold enough oil. So what you want to try to do with the honing process that we're going to do when we freshen it up for certain is have it really flat on top with valleys underneath it. We'll have a plateau finish. Hmm. So what can happen sometimes is that you lose the valley. It's worn so much that there's not enough valley. It doesn't hold enough oil. And that could cause the higher levels of blow by. So to see if maybe the blow by we saw the dyno was because there's not enough valley maybe. We're gonna check that out and see what service finishes. And what this tool is, what it does, it, so it can measure down uh, in microns. So that's millionths of a meter. Hmm. So just to kind of give you a reference, so this thing in micro inches, um, 100 micro inches with this machine is a tenth of a thousandth. Huh. A tenth of a thousand. Those are some really intense fractions. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But that's what we do, so. so. What does the Game Boy say? Is it making its graph right now? Yep. Not a lot of valley. Pretty smooth. But I would also expect that for this era. That engine built in that kind of time frame, that was a thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, perfect. All right, so your RA, that's your roughness average, it's is bad. nine. That's, no, that's pretty low, it's pretty good, right? Your RK is 20, your RPK is four, that's just because it's worn down. But your RVK, that's the valley depth, yeah. is 24. That's really low. That was very common to what we did. Yeah, so for yeah. a Molly type ring, uh, which was common of the day, yeah. That's the kind of finish you had. So with the modern stuff, with the steel rings and the thinner rings, you want that number to be basically double. Hmm. So this is still doesn't tell us why it no. only made 480 horsepower. Nope. Not really. What the, is... the most conclusive thing we've seen so far is the compression ratio. Oh, the, the still like. <laughs> that's that's the biggest thing we know for a fact that those were cup heads made for high compression domed piston and is there a reverse dish you know less than a flat top piston to bring compression down so obviously that's going to affect how much power it can make by by lowering that see so this has got really lazy uh lazy airflow because it would have if it's made for more compression it would have uh that's it, runner really volume speed. that's really more engine speed okay now, compression is what you're doing once you get the air in the cylinder. So, like the camshaft, camshaft's not crazy. Um, we ran at 8,000 RPM, which isn't actually a little bit past 8,000 RPM, but it didn't make any power, it's just dead. Which means, yeah, it's just. Yeah, I wonder what the actual compression ratio is. Were these pistons for 9 to 1 with a different head, and now it's like eight and a half is this like it eight very well could be right so i think that's one thing to maybe we might do is cc 
the piston and CC the heads and figure up what our compression ratio actually was. This is like an eight to one boat motor now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, it, um, that shows why I didn't really respond to any more time. It makes didn't really sense. care. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, you can try to help it all you want, but it's just not gonna get there from here. If we can get custom pistons made in a reasonable amount of time, that's the best thing to do. That way we can really optimize what we have here. Take advantage of, you know, the really good quality rods, and they're good CP Corilla rods. Uh, they've got DLC coated wrist pins. So there's a lot of good parts and pieces in the engine that you'd like to take advantage of. If we could, looking at the heads, checking out the valve seats, doing a new valve job and all that will probably be a big part of that. But we know that, I mean, it made 170 PSI uh, cranking compression, so it wasn't low wasn't dead, yeah, none of the rings were stuck. Looked at all that, so the pistons aren't shot, rings weren't stuck and all that, so you just yeah. gotta figure out a way to bring this baby to life. But hey, the bar is really low right now, which yeah. is actually kind of hel helpful, right? It's like, yeah. it, we're not starting really high, we're starting pretty low, <laughs> you know, so. All of you, like the, the perfect custom piston, what compression ratio would you want this engine to be? Well, depending upon what fuel we run it on, 13 to 1 or so is a good number. Uh, but we'll also defer to Dennis on that and what he, what he thinks. He, he knows these cylinder heads and this stuff better, what he thinks he can get away with for this bore size and those cylinder heads and what we're trying to do. Because you can't run the same fuel when you're endurance racing than you do drag racing. Yeah. Because drag racing fuels are different because it's so much colder at shorter duration. And when you're doing endurance racing, that fuel has to be able to handle that heat. And so the vapor pressure is gonna be different. There's a lot of factors of that. And because of this bore size, that will be one of the limiting factors of what the fuel is. Cause you, the bigger the bore you make it, the faster the flame has to travel to have complete combustion. We don't know. We, will we don't know. We will find out. We will, we will. We, we've got work to do. But that's fun though. That's what actually makes this a lot of fun is we got, a mystery to to solve and there's a lot of power to be to be had because an engine of this size at 8000 rpm should be able to make a lot more power okay dad so you said that motor is supposed to make 730 ish something like that okay. well, we, should be, we should probably need to find the dyno sheet so remember the last time you raced the car yeah remember how much of a horsepower deficit you had oh yeah Okay, so it actually, <laughs> well, it made 480. What? Yeah. Good God. We, we, were, we, we, we checked it. They did, uh, Dennis and the guys did a compression check on it. Still pumped like 170 PSI, so it wasn't terrible. Mm -hmm. it had six inches of vacuum. It had about seven CFM of blow-by. So, I mean, not great numbers all the way around, but not 250 horsepower off. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. So we think between everybody, mm -hmm. we're going to bump the compression up because it was definitely a nine to one engine. Still. Still nine to one, yes. Okay. We can tell it by the pistons. So we're going to put new pistons in, bump the compression up probably about 13 to one. So we're going to try to get you back most of that 250. So when you go drive it again, you know, you can maybe feel that difference. Wow. All right. <laughs> do, 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 do you think you had any of the time sheets or anything from the last time you raced at VIR? I don't know, that motor wasn't in the car at VR. Okay. But it was at the car at Daytona and I won the race. Yeah, I never did. Okay. Yeah. Won the race there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that's really sure. saying something. Yeah, really, really, I don't know how that happens. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully. It was running like 205 at the start finish line. The plate engine almost power wise, so maybe so I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> so, anyway, well, well is, in all fairness, mm -hmm. we figure it's it has probably been sitting for a long time. Yeah, we, we figure the sitting has hurt the valve seats and some of that stuff blow by. So, we're figuring about 150 of that is probably just it sitting. Yeah, okay. So, we'll be able to quantify that when we put it back together. But, yeah, we, we looked at it pretty hard yesterday. I mean, we down to it yesterday morning. And we didn't leave until last night until every bolt nut was off the thing and we looked at everything because we were like, we can't believe it's off that That's much. Right. Everybody in the shop came over and looked at it like, no, it can't be that bad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that doesn't sound right, even for that motor for that generation back 
at that time to be that low. No, they all agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. All those parts and pieces, because it's good parts and pieces inside. Mm -hmm. okay. DLC coated wrist pins and Corilla rods and CP pistons, Hank the crank, crank shaft. I mean, it was yeah. good stuff. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So it was like, okay, well, we figure again, 150 of that's at least just it sitting. But we might need to get a hundred more out of it. So you know, we're going to call in all all the resources. Billy Godbolt from Comp and everybody. We're all ganging together. So hopefully we can get you back to seven thirty at least. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm believing that's going to be that much or more. I'm I'm really expecting. So. Yeah, we got to get at least seven hundred out of this thing oh, for yeah. us to feel good about it. Oh yeah. Because yeah. Dennis had a good truck motor back in the day. That era was seven hundred. So if we can't get to seven hundred, we're we're not doing something right. All right. Sounds so, good. Anyway, good. awesome. So that, that'll be the next thing. All right. Can't wait. Awesome. <laughs> well, this was a lot of fun and definitely a big surprise. We thought there would be something that would tell us why it didn't make that much power, but there wasn't. It was a bunch of little things. I will say, though, uh, Lake Jr. called me yesterday and he said he found a quote from Robert Gates when referring to a C3 headed engine. If you had 700 horsepower with that era of engine, you had a race winning engine. So that's kind of our benchmark is how far past that can we get with modern stuff we don't know it's going to be really fun to find out though make sure you're subscribed for part two we don't know when that'll be because i gotta get parts and you know do the machine work and all that stuff but you're here for it if you haven't seen the first video we did at lake speed shop picking up the engine showing all the history of the shop and telling us about it you're going to want to see that too Probably the rest of the Racing History Nerd Zone playlist also. But we're glad you're here. If you watched this far, you're into the same kind of things we are. So, like, we're on the same page here. And uh, this is really fun. We just have fun. We like to have fun here. We like to learn. We like to dig up history to find out what important things from it we can apply to our lives today to make the future even better, pretty much. If you want to support the channel, check out stapletonautoworks.com where you can find like this shirt, the boom tube shirt, or this hat, stickers, that kind of stuff. If you don't, we won't hate you, but if you wanna rep our stuff, we would think that's pretty cool. Every order gets a handwritten note signed by both of us, me and Logan. Everything gets packed and shipped right here in our shop. We're small business, two people, trying to make a living, having fun at the same time. And we're glad you're here either way.